Um, welcome back to your next lesson. Um, I just want to quickly do some revision from the previous lesson we did. Um, I just want to remind you that there are two different types of glands, the exocrine and the endocrine. Um, the exocrine has a duct, whereas the endocrine does not. Endocrine goes directly into the blood where, and like hits a specific target organ, whereas exocrine kind of gets released onto a specific organ or inside a specific cavity. Um, I also uh, realized that there's something I didn't mention to you, and the idea of a gland is quite important as well. So please also remember that glands are often made with glandular epithelium. So it's a columnar cell which has a globular or glo a goblet cell like directly next to it, and that is producing specific substances through secretion and not excretion. Um, I also want to remind you, like the definition of the endocrine system itself is that it regulates the metabolism with hormones and enzymes that can only affect target organs and this creates some sort of response. And remember, I directly related the nervous system to the endocrine system as well. So this response that occurs is like kind of important. So you can see in front of you over here that we've got the human endocrine glands. So we've got the pineal gland, I'm not too worried about that, thyroid and parathyroid glands. Um, you can see the four white little dots on the actual thyroid gland over there, the parathyroid. They're actually the size of a grain of rice, which is quite interesting. Then you've got the pancreas, which is a slightly more phallic object. You've got the ovary. In this case, it looks like a earbud. You've got the testes, you've got the adrenal gland, and you've got the pituitary gland. And what you're going to realize is like yesterday I mentioned a lot of the time that the pituitary gland itself is the master gland, but there is something that else that actually is able to, um, what do you call it, uh, control it. So um, I know you don't have access to this, and I can email this or put this on the um, Google Classroom if you'd like. So what is really important over here is just to note the positions of all the target organs. That is probably the most important part. Um, in the prelim last year, I actually put in a question directly where um, students had to draw or like boxes around where the um, adrenal glands were and where the thyroid was. So what you need to really get out of this, and maybe you'd like to like very rough sketch this entire thing, um, is just the position of all the specific organs. Do I expect you to know exactly where the pituitary and hypothalamus are? Not necessarily, but it is quite important. What you can see from the brain component over there is um, that the hypothalamus itself is made out of that tiny, tiny, tiny little like uh, triangular block right at the top over there. And then you've got the entire pituitary gland beneath, beneath that. So what I've added in over here, this is just a quick you know, learning possibility for you as well to go through all the different hormones that are produced by each one of these different target organs as well. Well, how those target organs are affected to a large extent and what they produce. So we have the hypothalamus, which releases oxytocin and vasopressin. I'm not worried about vasopressin. I'm more worried about oxytocin. And we'll go over what all of, what all of these do a little bit later as well. So don't worry too much. Um, then the base of the hypothalamus over there also produces um, gonadotropin releasing hormone. So this is going to indicate to the body like when it needs to produce it's gonad um, hormones, and remember your gonads are your ovaries and your testicles. Well, not your testicles, a guy's testicles, your ovaries. Then we have the posterior and anterior pituitary, which produces oxytocin, again, vasopressin, um, and then prolactin, follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Remember that follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone go directly with the reproductive system. Then we have the thyroid, which is producing T3 and T4. Mainly, we're just going to focus on um, T4, which is thyroxin. Um, and then also, please just note that there's another one that floats around called thyroid stimulating hormone. Then we have the adrenal glands or the adrenal cortex and the medulla uh, or medulla. depends how you feel like pronouncing it for the day. Uh, there we're going to find cortisol, uh, which is important, epinephrine and norepinephrine. Um, these are just like you know, producing adrenaline itself, which causes the body to respond in specific ways. So in other words, if you take drugs, um, the, the it's actually going to cause the increase of epinephrine and norepinephrine. And um, epinephrine and norepinephrine are actually the base molecules for a lot of your drugs. So a lot of the times it will be the base for cocaine and heroin and all those other bits and pieces. So you're actually ultimately tiring out your adrenal glands. And that's this epinephrine and norepinephrine is affecting how the brain functions as well. We've got the pancreas over there. 
um, they've just like taken a, a cross section through it and they've shown you what um, is produced inside there. We're going to be producing insulin. Um, please also note that glucagon comes from there as well. Then we have the ovary, which is producing our estradiols, um, progesterone, and estradiol, uh, estradiol is estrogen, and then we've got testosterone in heaven. So it actually stops the production or the stops the release of testosterone so that you don't turn into a man or have manly features. Um, whereas the testes, you can see over there is another cross section and you're looking at it from like the top. There it's producing testosterone and estradiol inhibitants. So it's actually stopping too much estrogen being produced, which is ultimately going to cause a man to have very feminine qualities. Okay, so this is on page 33 of the notes that I gave you. So if you would like to maybe highlight them or just make note of what the important components are, that would really help me. So you can see the top right hand corner over there, we have our pituitary gland, which is also known as the hypothesis. And then just above that, we have the hypothalamus. So that's that yellow dot you can see on your screen. So this secretes ADH or antidiuretic hormone, which we mentioned in the previous lesson, and oxytocin. This controls the functioning of the pituitary gland. So as much as the pituitary gland is the master gland, the hypothalamus controls how the pituitary gland functions. So don't just think like the pituitary gland is the be all and end all. If you damage your hypothalamus, you're going to actually struggle with like a lot of functions and there are instances and if you would like to google it like uh, where the hypothalamus has completely given up because of a car accident or something and their body like starts really just not working well and we'll deal with the term homeostasis a little bit later which is a word that you can kind of like attach to this idea um, and homeostasis a long story short Homeo meaning home or like homo, which means like the same and stasis meaning the state at which the body is currently functioning. And so you want the same state constantly. So homeostasis. All right. Then we have the pituitary gland. Um, it's a P-shaped structure um, and it is about 1.5 centimeters in diameter. I mean, that's absolutely tiny. It's a miniature. And this whole thing regulates how your body functions. It's found in the bony cavity near the base of the brain, as you can see by the slightly, I don't know, reddish pink, I don't know what that color is on the diagram over there. And it's attached to the hypothalamus by a stalk called the infundibulum. I don't expect you to learn the word infundibulum, but it's a nice way because we're going to be talking about the infundibulum later again. And there's two lobes, anterior lobe and posterior lobe. Now we're at the top right hand side of those notes and you can actually see where it says the anterior lobe just to the right hand side of it is a little stalk and that stalk is ultimately what is attaching the um, entire pituitary gland to the hypothalamus. So we're just going to go over the basics quickly. I don't need you to learn everything that's on this slide. Um, I just want to highlight some of the more important bits. So uh, the anterior lobe, and a lot of the time, if you want, I said that 95%, you need to be able to tell me the difference between what is secreted by the anterior lobe versus the posterior lobe. Um, but there's not that many, so it doesn't become that complex. So we have growth hormone, um, and I want you guys to try and remember what the other word for growth hormone is. You might want to write that down. So it stimulates general body growth and metabolism. Remember, by body growth, we're talking about bones and muscle. Then we have the thyroid stimulating hormone, which stimulates a thyroid gland to secrete thyroxin. And thyroxin itself is something that is going to affect the amount of glucose and how it is like moved around in the body quite significantly. Then we have luteinizing hormone, which stimulates ovulation and the formation of the corpus luteum. Um, the corpus luteum is something we'll do a little bit later. It's once the um, egg has been produced inside of this other cell-like structure, it actually needs to be pushed out from the ovaries and into the, um, what do you call those little arms again? The fallopian tube so that fertilization can take place. So luteinizing hormone does that specifically. So, and that's the process of ovulation. We have prolactin, which causes milk production after birth. Okay, so your boobs do, do start swelling. Uh, well, and the mammary glands start filling up, but ultimately it's mainly just for afterwards. And it's actually quite a sad story. Some women actually just don't produce prolactin whatsoever, and they need to actually take tablets to cause them to start like secreting milk. And on top of it, if um, for some reason, let's say, you know, 
you were you were functioning and maybe your sister or an aunt or something was not producing prolactin you could take um medicine as well this like medicine to actually produce prolactin as well and you could start breastfeeding um without having um the, a child then we've got follicle stimulating hormone um nice and important causes development of the ova or eggs in female and sperm in males so if we do not have follicle stimulating hormone you can imagine that it's just not going to happen um follicle stimulating hormone is so important um, and if it isn't released in high enough amounts, the body will just, you'll become impotent, which means that you'll just not produce any gametes anymore. Well, you'll produce them, but it'll never be released. Uh, then we've got the posterior lobe, which stores antidiuretic hormone or ADH and oxytocin. So releases ADH, controls water loss from the kidneys. Please highlight the hell out of that. And then it goes on to this whole little shebang about hot and cold water, uh, hot days and cold days. So this is all about how you can cause your kidneys to actually either absorb more water or um, stop absorbing water, which will mean that there'll be more or less water inside of your blood itself. Um, by this, you can actually shift the amount of water that is used for sweat um, and that is obviously affected now i am not phased by this um, it never comes it, it's not in the ib syllabus so don't expect you to do hot days and cold days what i do expect you to do is right at the bottom over there it says something about oxytocin so it says oxytocin stimulates the contraction of the uterine muscles during labor and stimulates milk production. All right. It also causes that um, sense of connection between you and your baby when it is born or you and your partner when you hug and, you know, you just share a tender moment. Then we have the thyroid gland over here. Um, this is like this bit just over here. So your voice box is quite a bit lower. It's just sitting directly over there. It's a butterfly shaped with two lobes on either side of the trachea. It secretes hormone thyroxin, which regulates oxygen use, metabolic rate, as well as growth and development. Now, um, I want you to start thinking. I mentioned earlier about a hormone called thyroid stimulating hormone. So if thyroid stimulating hormone is not released, what would that mean for the thyroid who's releasing thyroxin, which is regulating your metabolism? So in your mind, I want you to start thinking about that. Or if I overproduce thyroid stimulating hormone, which like really stimulates my thyroid, which really stimulates the production of thyroxine, what is that going to mean for my metabolic rate as well as my oxygen use, my growth and development? And also bear in mind that there's some people who are born without a thyroid. So, you know, from your perspective, what do you think would happen if you did not have any of that? We have the adrenal gland. Um, it's a pairs of gland above the kidney. The gland secretes adrenaline, which prepares the body for crisis situation as follows. So remember the whole fight or flight situation. Um, and to a large extent, I like to add fight, flight or fright, where everyone just like stops and <laughs> it's like nothing ever happens. All right. Um, this you need to know off by heart. Um, it does come up every now and again. Um, I haven't seen it. I didn't see it last year, but I saw the year before that. Um, so it increases the rate of the heartbeat and blood pressure. So this means that all of your nutrients that you have put in your system are now going to start moving a lot faster. It increases the rate and depth of breathing so that you can get more oxygen into your system, um, which means that you can make energy quicker, which means that you can function quicker. It inhibits the functioning of the stomach and intestines. If you remember from last year, we, uh, when we did the nervous system, I spoke to you about um, rest and digest. So only when you are at full like relaxation is your body actually digesting any of your food so adrenaline stops all of that because there's so much energy that's involved in digestion that it just says okay well we're going to stop all of this and now we're going to continue um what was i going to say about that also so remember now if you are creating a lot of energy it means you're using a lot of food so if you've ever had a big fright in your life you would have recognized that um you are extremely hungry afterwards or what is the first thing that everyone do does they give you sugar water and that is to try and replenish the amount of glucose that you've actually used in your system it can cause the liver to convert stored glycogen to glucose because remember your body uses glucose to the body uh, the process of cellular respiration and i want you to write down the equation for cellular respiration it's always important to have and that was grade 11 work so it converts your fat uh, where a stored fat into glucose and then that stored glucose can then be used to do a lot of work 
um, it constricts blood vessels of the skin, causing more blood to be available to the heart and voluntary muscles. So uh, remember, there were three different kinds of muscles. You had your cardiac, your involuntary, and your voluntary. So your voluntary is all of your skeletal muscle to a large extent, so the ones that you are going to move. So like the tone of your muscles is going to increase. And that is because you're forcing more blood to those so that they can function better. And this is where the big thing comes around where people say, um, you know, geez, like when I had you know, something very heavy fell on my child and I'm, I was able to pick it up off of them. This is what's happening to a large extent. Also, um, have you ever noticed that when someone has had a big fright, they look extremely pale? And this is because of the, the constricting of the blood vessels on the skin, which is causing all that redness to move away from the skin, causing you to grow a bit more pale. Um, increased meta uh, metabolic activity in the cells, we spoke about that earlier, and increases the tone of skeletal muscles. Um, that, that chunk is extremely important. I recommend you write it down and maybe add the little bits and pieces that I've said about each one, just so that you understand. Um, and please also remember when it says causes liver to convert stored glycogen to glucose, make a little side note over there and say relate to pancreas. We're going to do that a little bit later. Finally, we're going to talk about uh, secrete aldosterone. Um, and secreting aldosterone, which controls the amount of sodium levels in capillaries, um, and surrounds renal tubules, influence the sodium pump mechanism. So in other words, you remember through the process of osmosis that I can move the amount of um, salt around. And if I move that salt around, that means I'm going to move my water around. So if I can change the amount of sodium that is actually in my kidneys, I can force the water to move differently. Finally, um, on this slide over here, we've got the testes. Um, the testes are um, they secrete testosterone and like now things get a bit pear-shaped so a lot of the times people are like oh, okay cool yeah we completely understand um, how the testes work and how testosterone works and um, this is the stuff that you know so it stimulates the male sex organs and by stimulates I mean the growth and development of it so while while you are developing as a little fetus if your body has an increased level of testosterone you will produce the um, penis as well as the testicles, whereas if you have an increased amount of um, estrogen, you will then produce a uterus and ovaries and fallopian tubes and so on and so forth. Okay, um, It stimulates secondary sexual characteristics in males, stuff like a beard, deeper voice, um, bigger muscles, bigger stature, um, not necessarily growing taller, but it's just about being more muscly. Um, and one thing I want to add in there and please add this in somewhere, is that um, testosterone is not used for the maturation of sperm. So please recognize that we're not talking about how sperm matures, but we are talking about how um, testosterone increases the sperm production. So sperm production is probably one of the more important ones in this, as opposed to maturation. Maturation occurs at a completely separate spot within inside of the testicle. So let's not even go down that road. Now we're going to start at the, well, this is now the bottom right hand side of those notes. We're going to start with the pancreas. This bad boy is actually very impressive. Um, and a lot of the times you cannot live without your pancreas and you can't often get um, a transplant for pancreas because it's just so specific to the human being itself. So it has tiny groups of endocrine tissue scattered within the pancreas. So inside, you're going to notice that there are two different kinds of cells. Um, we have alpha cells and beta cells, as well as the islet of Langerhans. So if you can imagine that whole yellow structure itself being the pancreas, if you had to, like, if the pancreas was like that and you cut it like this and you looked from that side, you would see a circle like this with a whole bunch of cells. Some of those cells produce specific um, hormones, specifically glucagon or insulin, okay? And though that, that little circle, well, of the whole thing, these little circles over here are called the islets of Langerhans, which I'll show you diagrams of a little bit later. But they secrete insulin and glucagon. So don't be too phased about what insulin and glucagon now, um, but if I can give you a precursor to it, insulin converts sugar or glucose into glycogen, where glucagon converts glycogen into glucose. So we'll, 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 we'll write those out a little bit later. Okay, so what do they do? Insulin accelerates diffusion of, glu of glucose into the cells, 
um, the deficiency results in diabetes and causes liver to convert excess glucose into glycogen for storage because it's just too much. So the liver goes, okay, fine. Well, I'm just going to take all this leftover glucose. I'm just going to turn it directly into fat. And that is ultimately why some diabetics and some older people suffer from something called a fatty liver. And if you have a fatty liver, there's not very much you can do about it besides chop off what is damaged and hope that you have enough tissue left over to regenerate an entire new liver. Then we have glucagon, which raises the blood sugar level by accelerating the conversion um, of glycogen in the liver into the glucose uh, and promoting the formation of glucose from lactic acid and certain amino acids. We get to that later. Pancreas may be regarded as both an endocrine and exocrine gland because it also secretes digestive enzymes. So recognize that the glucagon and the insulin is the stuff that is going to be released by the endocrine gland, whereas the digestive enzymes, which have access directly into the small intestine at the right at the top by the duodenum, that is going to be part of the exocrine gland. Okay, so don't think it just does um, the very complex job of producing and changing the amount of glucagon, I mean, glycogen and glucose, but it's also converting a whole bunch of other stuff. Now, we have the ovaries themselves. This secretes estrogen, stimulates female sex organs, stimulates secondary sexual characteristics such as wider hips, um, more dainty figure than hourglass figure, um, 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 reduction, so like that you don't produce a beard unless you have high amounts of testosterone. And then the corpus luteum and placenta secrete progesterone, which maintains the pregnancy. Okay, we'll get to the word progesterone a little bit later. All right. Now, I want you to please go to activity one on page 39 of your textbooks. Use your notes that I've given you and fill out that table, please. OK, so the first one over there is STH. And I mentioned the other word for growth hormone. So I want you to go find in your textbooks what STH is and please fill that out. This table will be due by the end of the week end of the week speaking to you Kelly because you were the one who were confused about all of this all right good luck ladies um, I'm sorry these videos are a little bit long if they are too long please WhatsApp me and tell me they're too long